talk about people being able to make a difference. You know, I, I wrote down four points, and I don't know if they're the right points. I probably think of something else tomorrow. But, but the first thing is that food is actually at the intersection of most of our problems that we actually face in this world, if you want to. You know, poverty, malnutrition, waste, health, inequality, climate, nature. You've seen it come back in all of the talks from each of these speakers. You know, our food system is severely broken. If you would come from Mars and you look at the way we produce food to feed the world, you'd think we are nuts. There's absolutely no question about it. It's um, exacerbating, I would say, every single human being's biggest challenge, be it poverty and malnutrition, or climate change and nature loss, be it pollution, be it economic instability and increasingly wars and conflicts, you'll find food there. The second observation I have from everything, and I hope you agree with me, that it's about people. We should always remember that when we talk about a broken system, we talk about real people. We talk about their lives and their livelihoods. And I think Bob reminded us very well about that. It's in all of the discussions I've been in for the last 30, 40 years on food, it's sometimes hard to remember that people have to be central, that we're trying to solve the issues of the most disadvantaged right now in the world. And I think the uh, delegates that you heard talk uh, this uh, morning talked about the fishing communities, the agricultural workers, the impoverished women and, and girls that suffer from these broken systems. So these communities that are most affected by these problems, these people that are most affected by these problems, we just have to be sure that they are central in driving this, what hopefully is a just transition. If we forget the farmers or the fishermen or sideline the many others, the changes that we drive will simply not stick, in my opinion. If we expect that also those people have to bear the costs of our failures, which is often the case, we won't drive the changes. So my strong plea is to keep them at the heart of everything we do. The third observation I have is if food is linked to some of these challenges, or uh, most of these major challenges that we have in the world, it's also fair to assume that it's also where we can find the major solutions. It's absolutely uh, key, if you look, for example, at climate change, where food causes 30% of the problem, it's also 30% of the solution. In fact, I'm actually surprised in the world right now that with the transition we make away from fossil fuel, which is happening, it's not happening fast enough, but it is happening, that food isn't called out more because it's slowly becoming a bigger emitter, actually, than the fossil industry itself. But the, when we, when we uh, can fix this broken food system, which in my opinion is probably the biggest economic opportunity we have as well in this world, we tackle climate change, we restore nature and biodiversity, we lift million people out of poverty and address the issues of inequality if you want to. We uh, help millions of people live a longer, hopefully healthier and more productive life will better manage conflicts in these worlds and we reduce the possibility of future related shocks that might do enormous damage to our economies. Although people, and I had the pleasure to help develop these sustainable development goals, talk about goal one and two, food security and poverty, that we put on the, on the top of the hierarchy of the 17 goals, not surprisingly. I would argue that food security permeates, as I've mentioned here, all of the uh, sustainable development goals. The bizarre thing is that we've calculated things and the cost of our broken food system is about $12 trillion to our global economy. So the real price of food we are not paying, if you want my honest opinion. But if we turn that around and make it sustainable, regenerative agriculture, using the blue oceans and some of the things you've heard today, we can actually turn that into a $4 trillion benefit. I believe for anybody that is smart enough, small or big companies, we're sitting probably on the biggest economic opportunity by looking at these new forms of farming, by looking at the new technologies and the plant-based so solutions that we have, by looking actually at putting better laws or regulations in place when most of it actually works against us. The good thing is it's higher on the agenda. We had the food summit two years ago. We're getting it in the COP28 now. We had it last two weeks ago in the UNGA. Finally, people understand that you can't just talk climate change without talking biodiversity, without talking our food system. So people are waking up. But we need to translate that into much faster action. You know, the sad thing about all of this is it only takes about $350 billion a year. It sounds a lot to me, but it isn't anymore in today's world 
to change our bro uh, broken food system. And the benefits that we get from that are well estimated to be well over one and a half to two trillion dollars. So you'd be daft, you'd be daft, even as a businessman, not to go after that. And you know, humanity needs it. My final point, which is a point to you, uh, probably the most difficult to write in, in the time I had for sure, but, but it needs you. I think Bob explained it as well. We are all part of the food movement. You don't have to be in the food business itself to help us fix the food system, in my opinion. We have the technology. We know what we need to do uh, in terms of the regulations. We have uh, certainly the, uh, the uh, ideas. We have the money. So there isn't really any excuse not to tackle this. You know, it was M Nelson Mandela who said it always seems impossible until it is done. And I think here we are the same. So the real barrier that we're facing here is really one of human leadership once more encouraged that I've talked about so often when we have an opportunity to sit together. You know, systems don't fix themselves. Human beings build them, human beings break them, but also human beings have the possibility to reimagine them. So I think my message to you is that you came here today because you stand for a world where nobody goes to bed hungry. If that is the case, be part of that movement to deliver it. I believe you came here today because you know that our food system needs to change. Be part of that movement to deliver it. You came here because even if you don't always feel like it, I believe that your generation definitely has that opportunity now to change things bigger than any other young group of people in the history before you. If that is the case, then be part of this movement to deliver it. The food status quo didn't happen by accident. I think there are a lot of vested interests in food as well as what we see in the fossil fuel industry. Some companies, some governments have a vested interest not to change things because it's clearly working for them and we need to break that. The self-interest or the resistance need to be overcome. And I believe it's our collective duty, our collective duty to demand from everybody this better, this healthier, this cleaner, this more equitable, just food system that puts people central. I would argue that you could be these activists and you should be these activists. And you cannot be a climate activist, by the way, if you're not a food activist. You cannot be a human rights activist without being a food activist. So let us all demand change as consumers, as citizens, or simply as leaders with our own voices and platforms. We are, we are all part of this system. Don't walk away and frankly think it's someone else's job. Ask yourself how you, your work, your world connects to the food challenge and make the difference you can. Thanks for what you're doing.